Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that insists that Willie Nelson file his taxes for him. Ladies and gentlemen, the independently wealthy captain. Yeah, I had a bunch of money till the government took my hashish money. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for telling a friend. Today in the old garage icebox, we have a little Tramps Like Us IPA from Intersect Brewing. This is a citrusy IPA with an ABV of 6.5% and a garage grade of three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. Let's give some cheers to our good friends that helped us out with this week's beer fun. First up, a cheers to Andy and Charles at the Columbia River Roadhouse in Chinook. Yeah, get some. And a big, we like your jib to Blair in Minneapolis. This next one is from Carlos Lewis and the Young Wolf from Liverpool, England. The Young Wolf. I feel like we just gave a shout out to three dudes that are about to commit a bank heist. Yeah, or maybe like three dudes that are raising a kid as a wolf in the woods. And we don't know if, if she's a wolf or not. She might be a fox. Big shout out to Erica in Reston, Virginia. Next up, a big little cheers and a Ron Swanson please and thank you to little Linda from Kuniko Studio in Dallas. And last but certainly not least, we have Aaron flipping lids in Gig Harbor, Washington. Thanks to everyone for helping us fill up this week's Garage Icebox. Yeah, B, the are you in Beer Run? If you'd like to help out the show, and get something back in return, go to truecrimegarage.com, click on the store page, pick you up a hoodie, pick you up a t-shirt, pick you up a coffee mug, so many things, some beer pints, you can pick up some beer pints, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, let's talk some true crime. In June of 1965, Houston police officers forced their way into the home of Fred and Edwina Rogers, finding the elderly couple murdered and their bodies dismembered in the refrigerator or icebox. Their 43-year-old son, Charles, who lived in the home with the deceased couple, was nowhere to be found. Based on the autopsy, the crime scene, and the evidence, investigators believe that Fred was killed by blows to the head with a claw hammer. Edwina had been beaten and shot execution style. Investigators believe that Charles, their son, killed his parents, dismembered them, and cleaned up most of the blood. The house was staged to have the appearance of a robbery. A search for Charles Rogers was launched, and a warrant was issued for him as a material witness to the crime. This is a tactic that we've seen before in other murder investigations captain where they are not saying this man is a suspect they are not publicly saying this man murdered his parents what they are saying is we are searching for this man the best we could do is get a material witness search warrant for this man right and we can't find him anywhere locally very quickly within 24 to 48 hours of the discovery of the parents having been murdered There's a nationwide manhunt for 43-year-old Charles Rogers. The difficult thing here is Charles lived at the home, possibly owned the home. So fingerprints, that's not going to matter. Footprints, not going to matter. But what does matter is we have two dead parents and the house is filled with bleach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing. When, When you talk about the fact that there might be some like gambling or local mob or even national mob. Why would the mob clean up the house? There's no point to it. Or spend the time to dismember the bodies. Well, it's really, if but this the were dis- dismembering of the bodies could be to prove a point. That's true. Should, let's show you how vicious we are. And so when you come home, and again, well, maybe that's the reason why there would have been any cleanup. Maybe the whole idea is 
you're going to come home, you're not going to really notice much difference in the house. And then when you open up the refrigerator, you're going to find your parents chopped up. And that's to send a message. Um, I guess then the bleach would make sense, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. I, I guess the, the thought being here, if it was a robbery, if it was a hit, if it was a job, that you go in, you commit the murders, and you leave. You don't hang out there for hours, possibly days, altering the crime scene and dismembering the bodies. This case reminds me of an FBI Top 10 Most Wanted case that we covered in August of 2017. This is the Bradford Bishop case. He was age 39. He disappeared March 2nd, back in 1976, from Bethesda, Maryland, shortly after allegedly murdering his wife, mother, and children. Similar situation where everybody else that lived in the house was killed. The bodies were later moved, and he attempted to burn them and fled the area. The car, the family car, was found on an isolated campground in Tennessee. Similar situation to that, that the only person left, the last man standing, if you will, is labeled the suspect because that is the closest point we can get from perpetrator to victims. And he, Bishop, has been on the FBI's most wanted list since 2014, I believe. So they're still looking for him. Charles Rogers has never made it onto any of these lists. I was looking for uh, state of Texas most wanted fugitives, the Harris County, Houston City, FBI top 10. He's never made it onto any of these lists. Now, mind you, a lot of these lists that exist today did not exist in 1965 when he allegedly killed his parents and fled the area. The interesting thing, though, was they believed or at least worked on several persons that they believed to have been Fred Rogers, excuse me, Charles Rogers. Now, part of that is it's a pretty common name. So when they go, oh, there's a Charles Rogers in Oklahoma. Well, we got to go investigate him. Right. Well, it's just a common name. There were several people. They went to several different cities in Texas. They went to Oklahoma. I could find one case as far away as Michigan. And this one looked like a really good lead in Michigan because the Charles Rogers in Michigan had a pilot's license, had his own plane. They were very quickly able to figure out that the pilot's license did not match up with that of the one Charles Rogers that they, in fact, were looking for. There's even this weird story, too, where locally, on the local level, they locked up a guy, and the guy said he was Charles Rogers, and two people came forward and identified him as the Charles Rogers they were looking for. They held him in jail for several days only to find out that the man was suffering from mental illness. He was not who he said he was. And the two people that identified him, they simply were mistaken. It was somebody else entirely. What became of this, though, is Charles Rogers became somewhat of a ghost and he really became like the local boogeyman for the kids of that neighborhood and for the kids of Houston. It was said that for several weeks after the discovery of the bodies, the police were guarding the house. This is for several reasons. One, they thought that there was a decent chance that Charles Rogers might return to the home at some point. Got to catch him. The other thing was they were worried that vandals would come and vandalize the home. They couldn't do anything. This would be the banks and the police. They couldn't do anything with the home because the owners, regardless of how you shake this thing out, we talked about how Charles owned half the house or maybe he owned the entire house. The rightful owner of the home, be it his parents and him or Charles by himself, they could not locate them. So they couldn't just confiscate the home, take over the home and take all the belongings out of there. So they watched the house for several weeks. 
they didn't have any instance where Charles Rogers returned to the house. They were not able to find him. Then what happens in this bizarre story is they would go and periodically check on the house from time to time. After several years had gone by, now mind you, the house by this point has been abandoned for a long time. The yard probably looks crazy. The The house probably looks scary. And now you have these stories that are being told throughout the neighborhood of that's the house where Charles Rogers killed his parents. The police go to check on the house. They find a window in the side door were left open. Someone had entered the home and in the living room on the wall, someone wrote, I killed my parents. I am the killer. And whoever did this, they believe rifled through the drawers and, and looked for any potential valuables before leaving the home. Right. This story gets out and this scares the hell out of the neighborhood kids who are now being told by some of the older kids things like, you know, somebody saw Charles Rogers peeking in their window last week. Somebody saw Charles Rogers in the neighborhood. There were even uh, stories where the older kids would tell the younger kids, don't be out late at night by yourself or Charles Rogers will get you, cut you up into pieces and flush you down the toilet. So, yeah, he became the local boogeyman. And in 1975, a Houston judge declared Charles Rogers legally dead. This is so the estate could be probated. This is even though the case still remained officially unsolved and open with Charles Rogers being the only suspect. The house then is allowed to be sold. It sat there and sat there until they eventually demolished the home with the furniture still inside. I saw an article, Captain, that said that the the lot sat there vacant until 2000, until the year 2000, when condominiums were built in that lot and probably the surrounding area as well. It's a very attractive building that they built but the the neighbors were saying that whether it would be on halloween or the anniversary of the murders there would be people that would be there that would take pictures or light candles or just people that are fascinated by the case locally yeah in 2012 culture map houston writer sarah rufka wrote a chilling tales article titled houston's crime rate is low but its history is dark the city's five most notorious murders. The good news, as the article starts out, the year 2011, the city of Houston had fewer homicides than any year since 1965. That is quite the accomplishment for a city as large as Houston. Oddly enough, that is the fewest amount of homicides since the year of the still unsolved double Frederick and Edwina Rogers homicides. The list, like most places, refer to this case as the Ice Box Murders, which Sarah placed at the number four spot on their Houston's Five Most Notorious Murders list. The list also included the 2001 case of Andrea Yates, who drowned her five children in the bathtub of their home. She was later found not guilty by reason of insanity due to postpartum depression and psychosis. The other cases listed are the Sunday morning slasher case, the killing fields case, which we, which for all of the good people out there listening on stitcher, we covered this in our killing fields trilogy in August of 2017. And finally the serial killer Dean Coral, the case, which we covered as well in our Candyman episodes in October of 2018. So certainly this case remains on the minds of people at the local level. And as you said, Captain, very much now folklore and local legend in the Houston area. Well, like we both said, chances are he's the most likely suspect, but what would his motives be? Well, there are two prevailing theories as far as motive for murder here, because if we 
trace this thing. It appears that he lived with his parents for a good deal of time. And then it, something happened that made him murder his parents. And some have suggested that it was always building up to this, that the hatred that he had for his father, that the disagreements that he had with his mother, him being weird, them being weird, his father potentially being abusive, both physically and verbally to his son. Some have even suggested that this carried on into Charles's adult life and may have still been going on roughly about the time of the murders, that it was this abuse that led to him losing it, reacting, and killing both of his parents. But the icing on the cake being that they were cheating him financially as well. And at some point he discovered this and chose to seek revenge against his parents and kill them both. There is evidence to suggest that a couple of things were going on here. One, that they were stealing money from their son. The way that these reports go, Captain, I want to be clear here. Some state that both parents were knowing and willingly doing this. Other reports state that the father was the one doing this. Yeah. But they were stealing money from their son. And remember, we mentioned that there's evidence that says he owned a good deal of property elsewhere. What has come to light is that he found evidence that his parents forged the documents to make it appear as they were the owners of that property. And what they were doing was they were borrowing against that property. Basically, they stole the land from him right. and took out a loan against that land, the value of the land. They're collecting money based off of this. And then we already talked about the weird stuff with the house. Did it belong to them? Did it belong to Charles? Did they, was this a situation where he actually paid for the entirety of the house and they forged documents to make it look like they owned half of it? But again, you're saying this is all speculation. We don't have any actual proof of this. There is some proof. I don't have any that I can cite right here for mm -hmm. you today. But I, I do believe that there's a good amount of proof for this because we have a book that came out, and this would have been in 2003. In October of 2003, Red Bud Publishing released The Icebox Murders. This is a novel written by Hugh and Martha Gardiner. I'm hoping I'm saying their name correctly. According to a review in the Houston Press, The Icebox Murders is written as fact-based fiction and supposition. Interesting that it's listed as this. It's not listed as true crime. It's listed as fact-based fiction. An interview with the authors, Hugh states that 85% of the book is fact. The other 15% is fiction. They weren't able to get the true crime category for their book based off of that the case is still technically unsolved. They believe that they've solved it. One thing that I find fascinating regarding the financials, the financial element to the motive for murder here is that the married couple that wrote the book, the ice box murders, they are both forensic accountants People that are able to take documents, review documents, and then find out the reasons why and trace everything back to how numbers got to be numbers and how statements got to be statements and if, in fact, they are true or false. Well, this guy's missing and he's never been found. How does an individual like this do that? The book itself and their theory, Captain, is not without a certain level of conspiracy. And that, I think, is why the authors are saying, hey, look, it's 85% fact, 15% fiction, or left to the unknown, because in the book there are many unnamed characters, and these are supposed to be various politicians, real-life politicians and attorneys, 
as well as possible eyewitnesses who may have saw Rogers in other countries after these murders, or maybe even helped him or employed him after he fled the Houston area and essentially fled the United States because of the discovery of his killed parents. One thing that the authors cite, and this is something that was hold back information in the Icebox Murders case. Mm -hmm. It came out three years after the murders. So the murders were committed in 1965. Well, in 1968, there was a Houston Chronicle article where law enforcement was asking the public for their help. Well, you know, for three years in the small area, there was probably tons of rumors coming out. What they wanted was they wanted to identify a man who was using the name Anthony Pitts or to have the public come forward and point out and say, hey, I I know somebody using that name or I know Anthony Pitts. Here is where he is. Here is his location so they could go speak with him. Why would they want to talk to somebody named Anthony Pitts? Well, they believe that this was an alias that Rogers was using to flee the area. The way that the story goes is within a day or two of the murders, remember they were able to really narrow that down to just a few hours, either late Saturday or early Sunday morning, the couple was killed inside their home. So this would have been Monday or Tuesday of that same week a man went into an office building applying for a job, a welder job overseas. Now, there's no evidence to suggest that Charles Rogers was a welder, ever was a welder at any point in his life. However, the man matched Charles Rogers' description, and the key being here that the job was overseas. If Charles Rogers is as smart and brilliant as they say he is, I'm sure he thought he could figure out how to fake his way, at least to the point to getting out of the country. He applied for this out of the country welder job using the name Anthony Pitts. Right. What the Icebox Murders book authors, the husband and wife Hugh and Martha, put together, they don't think that Charles Rogers was as much of a recluse as what the papers would have us believe. They think that he was out living a pretty full life when he was away from his parents and away from the home, so much so that he had a girlfriend. The way that this story all ties in is that they believe that Charles's girlfriend, and they simply give the first name only as Jean, Uh worked at that office building. And he was going there not so much so to try to get this job out of the country it was more of a way for him to get a vehicle remember we said that both of the vehicles that belonged to the rogers family were inoperable the reports were that they were up on blocks in the driveway of the home he needed a getaway car and his girlfriend Jean was going to provide this to him he just had to go to the office and pick it up she didn't want to be tied to the murder house so According to the authors, Jean provided Charles Rogers with a 1959 Cadillac, which he used to help him get to the Mexico border or get to his Cessna airplane that we referenced earlier to get his ass out of the country. We're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Cap. A couple more twists and turns to possibly think about in this case. Well, Alice, are you ready to go dive down the giant rabbit hole? Yeah, I got my little dress on and I took my <laughs> little crumpets. You know, this one, you know, this will make you drink this. It makes you smaller. I like the one that makes me taller. Mm-hmm. So 
I'm going to drink my drink and let's swan dive down the old rabbit hole because there is another theory that takes much of the same aspects of that theory that we just reviewed, but it takes it a whole step further. And what is that? Well, that Charles Rogers was somehow involved in the assassination of our 35th president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Makes some sense just on the surface, having said that this double homicide goes down in 1965 in Houston, Texas, and Kennedy is shot and killed in Dallas in November of 1963. But the way that this general theory works is that Rogers discovered that his parents were stealing money from him and frauding him out of his property to which he says, look, I know what you guys are doing. I don't know what threats they believe were made. If he threatened to kick them out of the house or have them arrested, thrown behind bars or what, but in reaction to that argument about the financials, the theory goes that Edwina said, you know what you've been, yeah, we've been stealing your money, but you don't think that your father and I know what you've been up to for these last few years Yeah, that you and your goony friends got together and plotted against the president and killed the president. And by the way, we're going to keep stealing your money and keep abusing you and doing whatever we want as a form of blackmail because we know that you were involved in the assassination of JFK. Yeah, supposedly she was logging his calls. Um, again, you'd think that law enforcement would be able to come out and say, one, tell me if he was even living in that house, but was he receiving a bunch of calls and where were they coming from? Yeah, so this theory, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it one bit. There are plenty of holes in this theory, just as there would be with any of the conspiracy theories for kind of Swiss cheese (laughs) for the JFK assassination. So I don't want anybody out there going, well, the Nick, the old Nick, he's got an extra crispy in his (laughs) recent days, the old crispy Colonel. And now the crisp is now falling off. That's right. They, they think they've solved JFK's murder. Well, no, that's not it, but this is a very interesting story. And one that I'm been very pleased to have spent some time looking into recently. The way that this works is there were three men that were photographed by several Dallas area newspapers yeah. They were under police escort near the Texas School Book Depository shortly after the assassination of United States President John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. They're referred to as the three tramps. The three tramps. The three transients were all men, as the captain just said, later commonly referred to as the three tramps. Right. According to Vincent Bugalosi allegations that these men were involved in a conspiracy against the president originated from theorist Richard Sprague, who compiled the photographs in 1966 and 1967 and then gave them to Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison was the attorney that was going after and leading the investigation of Clay Shaw, who he believed was involved in in the conspiracy murder of John Kennedy. Now appearing before a nationwide audience on January 31st, 1968 on the tonight show, Jim Garrison, a guest on the tonight show, he held up a photo of the three tramps and suggested that they were involved in the assassination. Well, and one of the reasons people believe this is because we, we do have proof that these three guys were arrested. They all gave three fake names, and they, were, they all were released. Correct. And ever since then, ever since Garrison, his appearance on The Tonight Show, there have been various, upon various allegations of who or the identities of the three men 
that were arrested that day and called and labeled the three tramps. Now, Rogers, his father, Fred Rogers, had kind of a sunken in chin. And so you can compare one of the three tramps and go, okay, well, that guy has a sunken in chin. He has a straight pointy nose that would be consistent with Charles. But there's so few pictures of Charles that it's really hard to look at any pictures of the tramps. There's so few pictures of the tramps to look at either one of those and say that that's Charles Roger. I can't look at it um, and, and say that's Charles Rogers to me. Well, the thing that's difficult about Charles Rogers is there's not a whole lot of photos that exist of this man. And often the photos that we are seeing would be things like his senior picture in high school. We would also be looking at his days in the Navy when he was photographed in the Navy. So I don't know that you have a lot of great comparisons when trying to compare his picture to that of one of the three tramps. What is interesting, though, is that we have Lois Gibson. She worked with the Houston Police Department. She was a forensic artist. So she is the person that's going to make these composite sketches of suspects that we see at the post office or released on FBI.gov and what have you. Lois Gibson is the one that's said to have identified Charles Rogers as what is known as the small tramp. Tramp number three. Tramp number three. He was the, the shortest of the three tramps, according to Lois Gibson. And he was a shorter man. He was listed at five foot seven or five foot eight. And she says that he, she believes he was the small tramp. She also identified Charles Harrison to be that of the tall tramp and Chauncey Holt. She identified him as being, well, that my list here says the third tramp. Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, <laughs> it depends on what pictures you, you look at and depends on who's labeling them. Um, oh, I wonder if he's called the third tramp in this version because they show a picture of, of the three of them being led away from the area. Right. And he's the last one. He's the last one in the picture. But the, but the first one in the picture is who people think maybe Charles would be. So these three tramps, they're located in the general vicinity of where Kennedy's assassinated. And what's interesting is these are the tramps that were over by the, the railroad and the grassy knoll area. Yeah. And, so a lot of people think they were dressed as something else and then changed clothes. Um, they did get arrested. They were let go, but they gave fake names. So how, how would you be let go when you give fake names? I mean, I know there was a lot going on in, in that town, but a lot of people believe that this is part of the conspiracy because some people higher up people were able to get them out that maybe they worked for the CIA or they worked for the FBI. Um, but the only thing that really stands out to me when you're looking at those pictures, and I'll post those on Instagram as well, is Charles has a, it's almost like his right ear is a little different than his left ear, and it's more, more of a circle, and it kind of sticks out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the pictures of Tramp number three, definitely has the same type of situation going on with his right ear as well. It almost looks like like a deformity, like almost like a wrestler would have. But, um, yeah, that's the only thing that kind of sticks out to me to go, oh, may maybe, maybe that could be him. But then when you look at possible other pictures of um, Charles when he gets a little older, what maybe they think he, he would have looked like or what, it doesn't look anywhere close to him. What's interesting here is there is a little proof in the pudding. There is some reason to speculate that this is a possibility. And I think we should continue down that rabbit hole. So we have John R. Craig and Philip A. Rogers, no relation to Charles Rogers. In the early 90s, they released a book called The Man on the Grassy Knoll, did the CIA hire a psychopath to assassinate 
JFK. Now, the psychopath is Charles Rogers, but also could be Charles Harrison. Right. Now, who is Charles Harrison? Charles Harrison is Woody Harrelson's father. Yeah. This is a weird story. <laughs> but you, it just sounds like we're making this up. <laughs> right. It's, and, and 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 then that was the father of who? Well, oh, and the oddly guy from enough, Cheers. Yeah. I almost feel bad telling this story because Woody Harrelson's one of my favorite actors. He's amazing. I feel like I'm like I'm just doing a disservice to a man that I I enjoy his work very much. In September of 1982, contract killer Charles Harrelson this is one thing that you got to factor in here. Nobody's really arguing that two of these three men that they're saying could be the three tramps have already murdered other people right. or went on to murder other people. So right. they're known killers that they're filling the shoes of these three tramps. In September of 1982, Charles Harrelson, while wanted for the murder of federal judge John Wood Jr., quote unquote, confessed to killing the judge and President Kennedy during a six hour standoff with police, which later it was determined that Harrelson was high on cocaine. We have several witnesses that that witnessed this man state that not only did I kill the judge, but I killed President Kennedy as well. These witnesses later testified that they didn't really believe Harrelson, but these are words that Charles Harrelson said. A known and, killer. Yeah. And the way that the book puts this theory together, the man on the grassy knoll is that you had Harrelson, a contract killer, someone that you could hire to go off and kill someone. And Charles Rogers, someone who we know, spent time in the Navy, served in World War II, that these two men were going to be additional shooters, that they would be the ones shooting of the two tramps, and this Chauncey Holt would be a lookout. Right. And the way that this theory works is that they were involved with the CIA, they were CIA operatives, and they were also working with Oswald. And what's interesting, one thing that I found fascinating in the book itself is they show a picture. Anybody that's seen the movie JFK by Oliver Stone will know exactly what I'm talking about. They're, they spend a good portion of that movie. And I understand that it's a movie, but they spend a good portion of that movie in New Orleans where they show Lee Harvey Oswald passing out leaflets for the Cuba movement or whatever they were calling it. Right. Well, they show a picture in this book of Lee Harvey Oswald passing out said leaflets, the Fair Play for Cuba leaflets, in New Orleans. This on August 16th, 1963. This is not just some random photograph. This is a photograph from WDSV TV in New Orleans. In the picture, you can see reporters. You can see several other persons all dressed like Oswald. This is dark pants, white button up shirt with the tie passing out these leaflets in this picture here. Chauncey Holt, who is later said to be one of the three tramps identifies a man who is on the far right of this picture as, as being Charles Rogers, who he says he didn't know as Charles Rogers. He knew him under the name of Richard Montoya. And he says that it, he was an agent that he worked with, with Oswald. He was a CIA agent is what you're saying. According to this Chauncey Holt. Right. And there's also evidence or belief that Oswald had an office in, um, in like the CIA or the FBI they had a building that Oswald had an office with inside. So there's other people that have made those claims that Oswald has worked for our government in many different capacities. Right. And again, this theory has quite a bit of holes to it. And really the interlocking theory here is that 
in some form or fashion, all four, including Oswald, Chauncey Holt, Charles Rogers, and Charles Harrelson, were all working, contracted, or employed by the CIA during this assassination of JFK. Right. Well, think about the difference (laughs) that would have made after Oswald was shot and killed if they would have said, oh, by the way, he was working for the government. Wait, so the guy that you arrested that you believe killed the president was working for the government? That seems a little fishy. Well, I'm not going to lie. The pictures that I've seen and been able to compare uh, to the ones where Chauncey Holt are saying, look, in this picture taken in August of 63 in New Orleans, it does appear to me that Lee Harvey Oswald's in the picture as well as a man that Lois Gibson later identified as Charles Rogers and that Chauncey Holt later identified as Charles Rogers. One thing that's important here too, that's interesting is that in the mid 1950s, Charles Rogers joined the civil air patrol where he reportedly met David Ferry, who is believed to be a possible alleged conspirator in the assassination of president Kennedy as well. Isn't he the only man that has actually been brought to trial? No, that was Clay Shaw oh, that was right. Clay that Shaw. was brought to trial by Garrison. But again, somebody that people made a bunch of claims against saying that he knew who Oswald was, he denied it. And then later they found pictures and then found out that they were in the same uh, civil air patrol. So it's <laughs> as much as there's holes, there's a lot that are connecting the dots at least. Before we move on, I do want to mention Charles Harrelson was three times tried for murder. This is three separate murders. This would be the murder of Alan Berg, Sam DeGalia, and the murder of Judge John H. Wood Jr. That is the one that during the standoff for his arrest, he admitted to killing the judge and Kennedy. This is how you tie him to being one of the three tramps, and he does look like one of them. He went on to be convicted of two homicides, and later, I know that he attempted to escape prison on at least one occasion. Now, the problem here, though, Captain, is where this story falls apart of these three men, two of them, one, a known killer, the other Charles Rogers believed very much to be a killer. Mm -hmm. Where this falls apart is it looks like shortly after the release of the book, the man from the grassy knoll, the three tramps were identified and none of them were what Lois Gibson said. Uh, Charles Rogers, Charles Harrelson, or Chauncey Holt. Yeah, but I think I think the three tramps have been identified a million times now. I don't know if they've been correctly identified. Correct, right. They, they It's been, again, various allegations of who the three tramps were throughout the history ever since Garrison held up that photo on The Tonight Show. This has been going on since the late 60s. I mean, some people say these guys were arrested. Whoever they put their names down as, that's who they were, and they maybe had ID or had somebody check it out or whatever. And then there's other people that have said these guys were arrested and they used fake names. So, I mean, I I have never heard uh, any solid confirmation other than look at this picture and compare it with this other picture. Well, this is another confusing explanation, but the explanation goes as this, that the three tramps were identified in 1992 as Gus Abrams, Harold Doyle, and John Gedney. This is from journalist Mary LaFontaine, who discovered the November 22, 1963 arrest records that the Dallas Police Department had released in 1989 
which named the three men as Gus W. Abrams, Harold Doyle, and John F. Gidney. According to the arrest reports, the three men were taken off a boxcar in the railroad yards right after President Kennedy was shot, detained, and investigated as prisoners, described as unemployed and passing through the Dallas area, then released four days later. An immediate search for the three men by the FBI and others prompted by an article by Ray and Mary LaFontaine on the front page of the February 9th, 1992 Houston Post. Less than one month later, the FBI reported that Abrams was dead and that interviews with Gidney and Doyle revealed no new information about the assassination. Right. It being the FBI's claim that they tracked down all three of these men and none of them used a fake name when they were arrested. And this report stating that the three tramps in air quotes were held for about four days interviewed by a current affair. Remember that old TV show in 1992 Doyle came forward, said that he was aware of the allegations and did not come forward for fear of being implicated in the assassination. He added quote, I am a plain guy, a simple country boy. That's the way I want to stay. I wouldn't be a celebrity for $10 million. Gidney, independently affirmed Doyle's account and a researcher who tracked down Abrams sister confirmed that Abrams lived the life of a train hopper and died in 1987. That all seems pretty firm to me having two of the individuals coming forward. And then the sister of the deceased third tramp stating, yes, everything seems on the up and up with these claims where it gets wonky is that we have people that that push the idea and there's probably some proof to back this up i'm guessing i've not seen it i don't know but uh they're saying look dallas police have claimed to have lost the records of these arrests as well as the mugshots and the fingerprints so what are we to believe right. about the identity of these quote unquote three tramps yeah because if you gave me enough time i probably could actually pull up three maybe six different names that i've read in the past that don't match those names that that you're just given in that report but but that's the problem with this case or the problem with the the jfk assassination case What's really interesting is the ice box murders, which is a very different book from that of the man on the grassy knoll. I do want to point out here with the man on the grassy knoll, the authors, I'm sure they worked their butts off putting together this book. It's an incredibly interesting book. I, it it was a fascinating read. Now a question. However, I I don't want to jump way off subject. I just want to point this out. The picture on the cover of the man with the grassy knoll, that's supposed to be Charles. Rogers, yes. Right. I, I'm just going to throw this out there because I was watching um, that new show. It's like, it's not Unsolved Mysteries, but it's called something like that with uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Okay. And, and they were going over the D.B. Cooper case. Mm-hmm. And... It wouldn't be that far off of a a match for Charles Roger. I mean, I think they have D.B. Cooper being a little bit taller, but but not a lot taller. Um, But I could see that photo matching a little bit of the the composite sketch. Yeah, I guess, I mean, Charles Rogers looks like you're pretty average Joe. Um, There's nothing remarkable to me about his general appearance. So that, that makes it difficult. You could lump him in a whole bunch of different ways. The, the problem with the theory put forth in the man on the grassy knoll is it it really just seems to be a theory based off of Lois Gibson saying, look, these three men's pictures match the pictures that I've seen. And I have, of the three tramps. And then they are compounding that with 
this quote unquote cocaine confession of Charles Harrelson while he's in the middle of a standoff and shootout with police. Right. So it's very, very, very loosey goosey. Now, what isn't loosey goosey is the book, the Icebox murders. Both of those authors say, we believe Charles Rogers murdered his parents, took this Cadillac, got out of Dodge hopped in his Cessna and went down to South America where he lived and worked for several years and that no one, he was being aided and abetted by people that still lived in the United States in the state of Texas. They didn't come forward to turn Charles Rogers in because he was making a good amount of money for them in their mining operations down in South America. Right. He's helping them find gold and oil very valuable things. And what happened to Charles Rogers, according to the Icebox Murders book, they did say the thing that's interesting is, look, we couldn't find anything to connect him directly to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. However, we found things that do connect him to the CIA. They don't say he ever worked for them or was contracted by the CIA, but they said it is certainly possible. They left well, that window open. Yeah. What they believe happened to Charles Rogers is that there was a wage dispute at one of these mining operations and the, the miners attacked him and killed him with a pickaxe and threw Shit. his body in a river. And because of the nature of the attack, the heat, the river itself the body was not able to be fully identified. The best that they could come up with was a known associate of Charles Rogers was this man named John Mackey, who was running mining businesses in Honduras and Mexico. The Honduras authorities went to John Mackey saying that an American geologist had been killed by a group of miners with a pickaxe. They threw him in the river could you identify this man? He said, I don't know who he is. But again, this book is not <laughs> considered to be factual. It's considered to be partially factual. 85% factual. So their claim there is that, that Charles Rogers would have been working for and making money for John Mackey at the time that he was killed by these miners. Yes, which is very possible. Oh, and sorry, back to the whole point of the D.B. Cooper. History's Greatest Mysteries. It's hosted by Lawrence Fishburne. They took on the D.B. Cooper case. And what's interesting about what they found, because normally when they take on these greatest mysteries, they walk away with whatever they started. This uh, is different. They actually walked away with DNA that they're going to be able to present to the FBI. So now they believe they have D.B. Cooper's DNA on file. And I'm saying, just for the record, that's a very far stretch that Charles Rogers is you know, connected at all with D.B. Cooper uh, or that he would be D.B. Cooper. But... Or connected with JFK. or Yeah, or Oswald or any of them. But it's so fascinating that you have this horrific murder and the number one suspect goes missing. And we know that he worked for, you know, he was in the Navy. So he has other, those connections, but he has also these connections and oil where we know oil, a lot of money, money equals power. He would have a lot of resources to go, like you said, and possibly live his life somewhere else, which if he's responsible for these murders, there's no way he should be living around anybody. It's an intriguing case. It's still technically open, even though Houston police believe that Charles Rogers is absolutely responsible for the murder of his parents. What became of Charles Rogers? We don't know. And he's never been found even to this day, all these years later. It's an intriguing case, an intriguing conversation with intriguing possibilities.
Thanks for joining us here in the garage. For more True Crime Garage, download the Stitcher app and check out our bonus show called Off the Record. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading this week? It is with absolute great joy and excitement that we recommend The Killer's Shadow, the FBI's hunt for a white supremacist serial killer by legendary FBI profiler John Douglas. The Killer's Shadow is available as of November 17th in all of the best forms, hardcover, paperback, audiobook on Audible and Kindle. And you don't have to write that title down right now as we have that great title and many others on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.